Welcome everyone. On behalf of Stanford's Graduate School of Business, School of Education and Law School, we are honored that you can join us for this program. We endeavor to create meaningful opportunities for Stanford alumni to connect with one another around common areas of interest. So we are proud to bring you this program that is a collaboration between our three schools. Before we begin, please note that we have turned your audio off during the panel discussion so the speakers can maintain a consistent flow of conversation. However, we encourage you to leave your video on during the program. If you would like to submit questions to the speakers, please utilize the chat function. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion, though we may need to combine some of the questions if time is short. Following the panel discussion, there will be an informal time to network with optional breakout rooms. This portion of the program will not be recorded. Any and all are welcome to stay. Lastly, Diego with Lala can only join us by audio today, and we're very glad he is able to participate. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to our panel moderator, Julia Moreira. Thank you. Um... I'm glad everybody's here. Welcome to this panel. Um, I am Julia Moreira. I am uh, MBA class of 1998. I work for Grupo Alpha in Monterrey, Mexico. I have been with them for 15 years and I run their corporate foundation. Um, we are actually a different foundation to most corporations in Mexico because we are a foundation that is an operating foundation. We started off as a grant making foundation and in 2012, we underwent a strategic revaluation with McKinsey and designed a program that focuses on education and advancing education. And we are operating this program. We operate the schools. Our mission is to prove that social mobility can be attained in Mexico through education, which is um, something that doesn't happen much. And we operate middle schools, high school, and then we have a program that has a um, scholarship program for college. So we ensure that the kids that we work with um, get through all the, the years of education. And in this way, we target Mexico's problem of school dropout in high school, which is big for Mexico. And we also focus on talent. We actually focus on kids that are somehow um, talented and we focus on providing them the venue and the road to education. Um, so I am very um, interested in education and I am joined today by four Stanford alumni who are doing wonderful things in education and um, they are truly making a difference in their different countries, and I would like each of them to introduce themselves. Um, we will start first with Ana Paula Pereira. She is the executive director of Instituto Soho Grande in Brazil. Thank you, Julia. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all and among these amazing panelists. So thank you, Stanford, for organizing this event and for inviting me. Um, as Julia said, I'm Ana Paula from Brazil. I am representing the School of Education where I completed a master's in international education policy analysis in 2019. And I'm currently the executive director of Instituto Sonho Grande, which is a Brazilian nonprofit organization with the mission to scale projects with evidence of high impact on Brazilian public education. Since 2015, we have supported the expansion of a full-time high school program, which is an alternative model to the, the model prevalent in Brazil, because normally students in Brazil in public schools go to school for four to five hours a day. Our model uh, supports uh, a school day of seven to nine hours and a whole different approach in terms of pedagogical uh, model and curriculum. And in terms of this work with the full-time high school model, we work in partnership with 19 of the 27 states in Brazil to help them expand this program and better execute the school model in order to have the results in students learning uh, Portuguese math and all the other subjects that we, we expect them to learn uh, in K-12 education. To tell you about some of our numbers so far, we support um, 780,000 students in Brazil uh, today, um, we, who are in more than 3,000 schools and represent 
more than 12% of Brazilian high school enrollment nowadays. Our goal is to reach 50% of high school students by 2034. Um, and the impact of the program we support is, for example, four times the impact of reducing the size of the classroom for those who work with education. This is known as something that helps. And 1.5 times the impact of studying with a good teacher instead of a weak one. And also we have greater chances of going to college and higher average wage, wage from students that uh, graduate from our program. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm excited to have this conversation tonight. Thank you, Ana. Um, I would like now to introduce uh, Diego Ontaneda Benavides. He is a co-founder and the CEO of the Latin Leadership Academy and he joins us from Colombia. Um, thank you, Julia. Uh, and everyone, I'm so sorry that I, I'm not turning my camera on and that, that I sound like this. I'm recovering from surgery and you don't want to see me right now. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's such a pleasure to be here um, to, uh, to talk about this topic in a multidisciplinary panel. Uh, it's really exciting. Uh, I graduated from the GSV 2018 and since then founded LALA, Latin American Leadership Academy. Uh, LAL is a, a nonprofit organization that seeks to promote sustainable uh, and shared prosperity in Latin America by developing a new generation of leaders. Uh, the, the inspiration behind LALA uh, came twofold. One was me growing up in Peru and seeing all sorts of political, environmental, social, economic problems and wondering how to tackle them. Like what, what is the single point of highest leverage to start unraveling systemic problems countrywide. And honestly, I, I didn't arrive at, at any good answer. And then years later, I worked at this incredible organization called African Leadership Academy, ALA. I encourage everyone to look them up. They were founded by two GSBers um, back in 2008, more or less. And what really inspired me there was that they were finding teenagers who already had an incredible sense of mission and purpose to solve the problems that they had grown up seeing in their communities. And it was there that it clicked for me that perhaps the single highest leverage thing we could do to promote change at scale, authentically, sustainably in a continent was to find these young people and empower them to become the, the best leaders they could be and what excites me about this panel is that part of the vision is not just that they will become a, a separate collection of leaders solving problems in separation, but that they can come together, kind of like how we're coming together here across disciplines, across countries, across uh, the private, public and social sector, across the socioeconomic spectrum to address the problems that plague Latin America. Uh, so that's that's the the quick summary of Lala. Uh, looking forward to the conversation with all of you. Thank you, Diego. Now I would like to introduce Felipe Neves. He is the founder and the president of the Constitutional Law School Project, and a non-for-profit organization he runs aside from his day to day. Thank you, Julia. So first of all, I'm really really honored to be here and happy to share. Uh, this panel with an amazing group of people. Uh, my name is Felipe Neves. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I graduated from Stanford Law School LLM program in 2019. And although I'm a lawyer working at Clary Gottlieb with corporate and financial transactions, working with uh, public education represents a big part of my life. I am the founder of Constitutional Law School Project, the biggest civic education uh, nonprofit organization in Brazil. I started giving uh, constitutional law lectures in a public school nearby my law firm at that time uh, six years ago and nowadays we teach constitutional law civics and politics to more than 25,000 public school students in person every year uh, we believe that in this way students understand the role and duties of our politicians uh, the importance of conscious voting and also now they understand their individual rights and guarantees as citizens so uh, if they have a problem, they can go after the right politician in order to demand improvements in their own communities and schools. And also we provide scholarships, mentorship programs, and help low-income students to 
to find internships uh, and jobs in areas uh, mainly related to law. I also recently launched a social ed tech called Civics Education. Uh, we sell legal courses from top tier Brazilian lawyers and we use the revenue to fund scholarships to low income students. And we also produce free courses to public school teachers, but happy to talk more about it later. So again, really happy to be here and uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you, Felipe. I would like now to introduce our last panelist, Juan Manuel Gonzalez. He is the CEO of Enseña por Mexico, which is part of Teach for All. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Felipe, Ana Paula, and Diego. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I want to start by sharing that, as everybody that is here, I love education and it's my passion. And even though it took me a while to completely dedicate myself full time in the edu to the education sector, uh, is definitely what I love to do. I've been part of Enseña por Mexico for, for the past two years and a half. I graduated from the GSB in 2016, and at the same time, I did a master's in education. And the reason I went to the GSB is because I wanted to come back to Mexico after spending 14 years in the United States uh, to work in education, and in particular because um, I grew up in a lower middle class uh, neighborhood of Guadalajara where I started to see the differences that happen to a human being when you get good education. Um, uh, I was able to see this personally when I will be in, in the United States after going to good education, going to Texas A&M, getting a good job and getting a scholarships and then coming back to Guadalajara and seeing many of my cousins, many of my friends being involved in crime and being involved in things not necessarily because they, they wanted to, it was because they didn't have any other better choice. So that's what opened my eyes. And it was when I decided that I was gonna go back to Mexico and work in education and in particular in an organization that would focus on providing graded opportunities to Mexicans, no matter what was their zip code. So that's how I ended up getting this executive uh, job at Enseña por Mexico. I, I, I've been part of the organization, as I say, for the past two years and a half. And what we do is recruit uh, talented professionals that will join a leadership program that is a full-time program for two years in which these professionals will be assigned to public schools and they will seek to achieve three, three transformations. The first one is the personal. We want them to become the leaders that Mexico and the education sector needs. Uh, second is educational. So they gotta make sure that they improve the opportunities academically and socio-emotionally for their students. And third, socially, they gotta make sure that they work with the communities to make sure that they, they create the collective leadership necessary to make the change. We believe that the, the leadership that we need is already in the communities. We just need to spark it and it's part of what these leaders do. Uh, we call them Profesionales Enseña por Mexico. We have been in Mexico operating for the past eight years. We have impacted more than 100,000 students in 10 different states of the country. 474 fellows have completed the two-year two leadership program and currently we have 243 fellows. And uh, I love it. I love what I do. It's definitely something that I will say. I spent six years in consulting and my current job is way harder than any other project that I did in consulting, but it is this passion and love and change that I'm seeing in this community that keeps, keeps me going. And thank you for having me. Thank you to the four of us, uh, the four of you, sorry for this um, background. And as you can see, everybody is uh, trying to target education and advance education in Latin America through different areas, teachers, um, civic education, a, a little bit of everything. So I wanted to open up and ask you guys what you four think are the key challenges that Latin America is facing in this area. Um, I think we all agree that it is a big issue and the inequality of education needs to be pushed forward. And we all uh, are participating in that. But how do you see just on a broader perspective, what the key challenges are? And do you think that some of those have uh, changed because, because of the pandemic? Um, any thoughts on that?
a lot of thoughts on that. So, uh, so for me, for me, is I think it's important to explain the context of the Brazilian education. So, Brazil has one of the biggest disparities uh, between the richest five percent and the poorest five percent. In Brazil, the, the five percent most vulnerable have the same human development index as this, the five percent most vulnerable in India. But also in Brazil, the richest five percent have the same human development index as the richest five percent in Europe creating this huge disparity in Brazil. And for me, the main reason is the quality of public education. So in Sao Paulo, we have the same GDP per capita as Chile, but why don't we have the same education indicators as Chile as well? So first, only in the state of Sao Paulo is where I live. We have more than 5,000 public schools and more than 3 million students. So to give you more color, uh, the biggest uh, educational district in the US is New York, and they have 1,000 schools and 1 million students. So we have a lot of schools to handle uh, in the same district. And because we have such a large educational system, we lack of individualized training and support for our teachers and students. And therefore, sometimes we even have uh, biology teachers teaching physics, Portuguese, math. So because of that, uh, public school students, they do not receive the proper education that they should, not being able to prepare for college admission tests or for professional opportunities. So uh, they don't see a future in public education. And because of that, for me, long story short, we are likely to have more unqualified professionals school-wise, and we will increase the offer of those professionals, but not the demand, which will reflect in their salaries, which will be lower. And that's one of the reasons, for me, the main reasons of our social and economic disparities in Brazil. And I believe that's what we do here at the NGO, that in order to change our country, our society, our neighborhood, the civil society, like regular people, companies, at least for now, uh, they need to help the government to prepare our students and give them more uh, educational opportunities. So uh, I think that I can relate to Juan and Diego as well. Uh, we cannot give like a lot of opportunities, but if we focus in like giving to one student, that's really good. He can serve as a role model for the entire school, community, neighborhood, and this one student can give the example by changing his or her life through education. And we are trying to create leaders uh, in those low-income communities that can show the way for a better future through education. So th that was my main perspective of, of Brazil and what we do here as a civil society to help to, to, to improve our education system. Thanks, Felipe. Uh, I would like to add uh, in Mexico in particular, I'm going to talk about it in, in two ways. The first one is from the reforms, from the political aspect, the policy, uh, is that I think is the, the thing with Mexico is that every new administration that comes into power creates a new reform, creates a new policy. So uh, we forget that education, in order for us to see a change, it, requir it requires a long time. And it will continuously changing every six years in, in the case of Mexico. Every reform that we, we create, we're not gonna see the result that we're expecting. So that is one of the things that I think is one of the challenges in Mexico. I would like that education was not, was not a political case or was not seen as an opportunity for politicians to show something. And we will create reforms thinking in many years ahead and avoiding to change it every six years. The other aspect is I think that, is, uh, that I has affected Mexico is for many years, um, teachers have not received the respect that they deserve. They, de they do a very hard job and it's easier for us to criticize uh, because of unions, because of many things that we see on TV, we start criticizing and put the blame on the, on, of, of the effects of education on the teachers. And in reality, the, the majority of the teachers in the case of Mexico are doing a great job, want to do great things for our students. Unfortunately, they're not receiving the preparation, the training, all that they need to make this change happen. So that is the other aspect that I see. So like, I definitely see those two main challenges, the political aspect and the uh, not recognizing and, and being respect, uh, respecting teachers.
for the value that they contribute to society. I agree with both um, Juan and Felipe, and to add, uh, and starting to answer the second, second part of your question, Julia, uh, all of these challenges are being greatly enhanced by the pandemic. So something that Felipe talked about, which is a big inequality, is something that is going to be uh, enhanced by the pandemic. So we are seeing two main impacts that are coming from uh, the pandemic. The main one will probably be uh, drop-off rates, which are already really high in LATAM, and they will be higher for the most vulnerable students because of the effect that the pandemic poses in families' financial situation and everything. Uh, a lot of this, those students are already not as engaged so also because of that, we are expecting a really big uh, uh, increase in dropout rates. And this is going to be uh, very difficult to compensate for afterwards. And with that, we are already also expecting a big learning loss because schools have been closed for a long time in Brazil, particularly it's almost a year now. It's longer than most countries in the world, unfortunately. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of studies have already been published uh, in, in proving that the learning loss will be huge for uh, poor students because they don't have as many help and support from their families at home to continue studying and learning while they are there in remote learning or not even remote learning at all. While uh, the richer students and families they have a lot of different kinds of support and sources of support, and they will still face some learning loss, but not as much. So all of the impacts that we are talking about that are already big challenges in Latin for education will be unfortunately enhanced with the pandemic. And we need to uh, reinforce our work as civil society, as nonprofits, to be able to compensate that in the months that are coming. Uh, I'll, I'll try to add thoughts uh, that, that don't duplicate what the others said because I, I agree with everything you all said. Uh, so just for some, some context setting in case uh, anyone in the audience is not familiar with these horrible stats, uh, Latin America is the region with the highest income inequality in the world. And if you look at the link I'm pasting in the chat, we're the, uh, well, there's only data on two Latin American countries, but we're also a region with no social mobility. So what what does social mobility or what do pathways to social mobility look like for someone that is starting in sectors uh, D or E or S, or Estratos 1 or 2 in Colombia and so on? Uh, usually people are told the old story of work hard, study hard, and you, know, you, you will reach opportunities. Unfortunately, most of those pathways are only really open for kids. Again, thinking about the lowest income kids, uh, if you're a math genius, a science genius, right? If you win the, the science Olympiads, you get uh, a really high equivalent to the SAT in your country, whether it's a vestibular, ICFES, and so on. And then hopefully you get into a university uh, with a scholarship. But then most of those kids have had to spend most of their uh, formative years really focusing on a few quantitative courses. So by the time they get to these universities, they're really underinvested in social emotional skills. Plus, they're now usually far from home. Maybe they grew up in a province, now they're in a big city. Maybe they're darker skinned. Uh, and I'm, I suspect that in all of our countries, uh, there's deep racism and elitism. So it's unsurprising that for many of those kids, uh, trying to access opportunities that way is broken. Uh, actually, uh, someone in the audience saw him here. Uh, Daniel Uribe started a, a nonprofit called Mentors for You Colombia because he, he saw that once the top of these kids get jobs, they're underpaid. <laughs> because again, they're the dark skinned kid from a province who doesn't have the communication skills, doesn't have the social emotional skills because they 
overinvested their whole lives in the one trick that could get them access to opportunities in our countries. So that pathway is bro broken for most people. The other two are uh, some combination of informality and crime. And you've seen it in your countries as well. And unfortunately, those pathways are much more effective for many of these kids. What is frustrating, uh, and I saw someone else in the audience, uh, Antonio Puron, that is uh, starting a cool, or has already started a cool ed tech company. There are tools out there for many of these kids to reach a good education, right? Like they don't have to play the same uh, games to enter these very few educational opportunities. But the problem is uh, access to internet, uh, which uh, like Ana Paula said, is, is going to make this harder for kids. But the other problem that, that we think about is uh, motivation, right? Like if you're one of these kids and you grew up in one of these uh, favelas, comunas, rural areas, you're dark skinned, you're low income in a Latin American country, where's the motivation for you to try hard if, uh, if most of these pathways to opportunity are broken? So um, Felipe, you mentioned it in passing. I love the comment of how important it is that we make a few more pathways open to more diverse kids from our countries so that others who grew up like them will become inspired and see that it is possible to escape poverty and to do something with your life that doesn't have to just be, uh, you know, be a math genius and then study engineering. Um, so I, I wanted to bring that up because most of you in the audience are not, I believe, in education. I, th I see, I think there's a lot of lawyers and business leaders. So, uh, so some of us are trying to create these new educational pathways, focus more on social emotional learning, try to spot hidden gems in low income sectors of Latin America. But then are you on the employer side also taking risks, partnering with organizations like ours to spot those uh, more diverse kids who don't have the traditional markers of success, of potential, because each one of them that you give an opportunity can become a hero to an entire community. Uh, so I, I wanted to leave you all with that, that slight provocation. Can I add something? Because it definitely was a provocation and I love the perspective that Diego brings of the equity aspect. Because in Latin America, we have, for many, for many years, we thought that what we needed in education is it was equality, but we don't need that. We need to get into equity. We need to give resources to more resources to those students that needed the most and not the same to everybody. We need to understand that there are people that were already behind when they were born because they were born in that community. So we need to figure out ways to create opportunities for this. And also like in, in my case, in my, part, in my particular case, I believe that my success was by accident. So we need to create, design it. We need to make sure that success is designed for every individual in the society. And that is not an accident. So like we definitely need to change the models and it's a, it's a systemic problem. It's not just education. We need to look at it from the private, public, civil society sector to change it. Otherwise it's gonna continue the same. And to change something that is systemic requires all of us working in, in synergy and it's very hard to achieve, but I'm sure that if many of us were to sit down and think how we can bring our perspective of what we know and how do we make sure that we change an entire system on how it works, like for example, in Mexico, I don't think it is even enough to get a good education. What matters is your network. You might be the, like Diego was saying, you might be the best students from a public university, but a, a, the average student from a private university is gonna get a better opportunity. So it's not just necessarily about giving a merit, it's about changing our perspectives and the way of thinking. And like I say, making sure that success happens by design and not by accident. I actually want to echo that on Juan Manuel because in the program that we have, we, we start with our students in seventh grade for underprivileged areas. And when we started the program, um, we met, uh, asked them what their vision was for the future, what they wanted to do with the future and their aspirations were all on the basic 
the bottom part of the Maslow pyramid. They wanted to buy a house for their mom because they didn't have a house or they wanted to put doors between them, but they never aspired to become. And if you ask seventh graders, which is our, our students in higher income areas in Mexico, they have other kinds of aspirations. So I think it's very important, like Juan Manuel said, to be able to prove and then the, the, the next generation actually changes those aspirations and sees that they can attain that through education. Um, following up on Juan Manuel, uh, you said Juan Manuel that there we are here and that the whole every area of um, needs to come together, the businesses, the government, us working in educations and non for profits. And taking on that, um, I wanted to ask what you guys thought were the major skills that we needed in this area where we work in the non for profits in the education sector, because in my experience, um, I used to work for Bain before, like Ana Paula, and there is so many things that I think we bring over to this sector and so many things that we can capitalize from being in the pr uh, pu uh, private sector first. So what do you think is the skills that we need to be successful in this area? I can start by saying uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to answer uh, this question because I actually believe that we need the same skills that any uh, for-profit organization we also need like Stanford trained, talented people to make things happen. Um, and this was a decision that in the case of Sonio Grange, we made from day one. Like we want to have an interesting and attractive career to be able to bring people that would go to Bain and other organizations to work. And that's how, uh, our, our, that's a big part of, of our secret sauce. Uh, to get to the, the, the 800,000 students and everything else. But uh, trying to, to give a more specific answer, I think um, in general, uh, fundraising skills are important because in the nonprofit sector, you generally do not have your own income. You do not sell products or services normally. So uh, fundraising and all that comes with that, uh, relationship, uh, interpersonal skills, uh, networking and everything is very important. Um, in our case, it's not exactly fundraising, but we do need to convince uh, public servants, governors, uh, state secretaries of education that this program is worth their investment and their time. So we also need to have like from a very quantitative analysis, uh, skill set in order to be able to gather evidence that what we are doing really works and has an impact from their uh, communication and advocacy so we can generate knowledge around what we're doing engage people and convince them um, to uh, implement this program in their school networks and after that a very hard implementation uh, skill sets because we need to be there with them, helping them navigate the complexity of uh, rebuilding schools, uh, uh, changing uh, students from one school to another because when you expand your time in school from five to nine, you lose your school capacity by half. So we need to reorganize the whole network and a lot that comes with that teacher training, for the new curriculum and everything. Of course, we don't have one profile that has all of the skills, but I'm just like giving some examples of how we see this in San Grande. And it is not easy to uh, recruit for a nonprofit as the for-profit sector. So this is something that is a, an important challenge. And uh, when we talk about how anyone here can help, I think, uh, supporting these organizations in this way, uh, recommending talent or uh, as mentors, uh, helping people see that working in the sector can be as exciting as the for-profit sector. We just saw Juan Manuel say how much he loves <laughs> what he does, I do too, and we can see that everyone here does. So I think this is a very, very, uh, important issue for everyone and our organizations. 
I may add, I mean, I agree with everything, but for me, you have to be really creative, especially when you deal with lack of resources. So I was running the NGO for two years with no budget at all. I was asking for, you know, goods and, and, and services directly from the company. So, hey, can you give me a scholarship? Can you give me laptops? And that's it. And uh, you need to be creative. I mean, we, we launched our ad tech and we realized that people will be willing to spend money if they knew that part of this money will be used to fund scholarships. So that's an idea that we realized that will be good and uh, it's being uh, validated as we speak now. And also, uh, I think that you need to bring people inside uh, the problem. So just asking for donations is, is not enough. If you ask for donations, but also if you let people join the solution, like by giving mentorship, by talking to the students, uh, they realize the impact and you know they bring more people in and like a cycle and a bug that bites you and you get addicted. So that, that's, that's something that I, that I learned uh, during this short period of time working with education. I, I agree with uh, Felipe and Ana Paula and in particular with the leadership and interpersonal skills. As the CEO or executive director of a nonprofit, you're gonna be dealing with people from all kinds, from very wealthy individuals to people that have very limited resources in the community, to teachers, to politicians. So you gotta be able to know how to behave and how to be empathetic to each of these individuals and find ways to create genuine relationships with each of these individuals. If they notice that you're trying to get something out of them, they can detect it very easily. So you have to do your homework and understand that you need to bring this empathy and identify what connects you. Because I'm sure all of us can connect with any person that in the world, but we need to identify that. So definitely interpersonal skills and also with the team. So you're gonna have to motivate a team. If you really are attracted talented people, unfortunately, we don't have the budget to pay them the same money that McKinsey Bain or any consultant or any banking that will pay them. So you have to think of creative ways to create intrinsic motivation in the employees that you're attracting to keep them because money is not going to be your main power. So you have to make sure that in these leadership skills, in this uh, culture that you're setting for the entire organization, there is something that keeps them there in addition. So if you hire someone because you're offering a good salary in a nonprofit, uh, more likely someone in the private sector can offer them a better salary because it's, it is known that unfortunately we don't have the resources to pay them enough. So definitely that is one of the things like and the last thing, like agreeing with Felipe, doing, being very creative and innovative. You have to do more with less. This goes in every aspect. Uh, your donors are going to be questioning every single item and making sure that you use it in efficiently. And there is nothing wrong with that. But like, I would like to just mention a side comment about this, that donors uh, should get to know the leadership team of the nonprofit so they can trust that they're gonna be doing good things for the resources and should give us more freedom to do what we need to do with that money instead of restricting it for something. Because when you restrict a resource, you're limiting the opportunity for this nonprofit to be creative and find solutions to grow uh, faster. So I will, I, I will say those are the three things. That, that I will say about what you need to have. Um, I'll, I'll add one more dimension. I was gonna say what, what Juanma was just tell, talking about, like the, the much more uh, multifaceted, nuanced leadership challenges for sure. Well, what I'll add is uh, how you have to combine multiple forms of knowing because at the end of the day, you're doing this work because you're trying to solve some complex systemic problem that hasn't been solved ever, <laughs> at least in, in this particular geography. So just, uh, so I think several of us are former consultants. Uh, so just coming with your consultant toolkit and being like, all right, 80-20, BC, not enough. 
because then you're like, well, let me learn about the history of this place. And now let's also look at the best research locally and in the rest of the world, let's say about education, cognitive science, uh, social mobility, trust building, movement building, and so on. Then you also have to do your, your whole lean startup, design thinking, prototyping. So you also have to bring that into the mix. And you have to do this all on the fly with no budget while you're often not in person with your team because often almost by design, uh, the funds are not where the problems are. So ideally you want to be, you want your team to be closer to the problem, but that's not where the funds will be. So uh, imagine the additional challenge of leading an organization and a team and like Juanma was saying, motivating them intrinsically because you don't have money when you're also not there in person. So <laughs> I think it's just uh, a really interesting accelerated way to develop yourself and face all sorts of challenges, both personal, interpersonal, intellectual, and so many more. Uh, but I think it's totally worth it. So following up on totally worth it, um, I think the the five of us are committed to what we're doing to the non for profit area in education. And I think you can see from the from the four panelists how passionate they are about what they're doing and how they found it. How would you guys um, discuss how you came to this path and how would you say that um, if you could turn back time and say, I would have gotten on this path before, I shouldn't have spent so many years at Bain. I really, this was the path that I wanted. Uh, and maybe more a little bit on the line of Felipe who is doing, um, doing it on the side to say, um, uh, how do you actually find where you should where you should contribute how you should contribute and how you will find this motivation to move forward well uh, so for me it was something kind of natural uh, so my mom single parent working two jobs she was a teacher so i just saw you know the struggle and her willingness to give me a better future so when i graduated i you know just decided to do the same thing before i have kids <laughs> and that's important because once I have kids, I don't know if I'm going to have that much free time. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm doing it as I can. So, uh, so for me, for example, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I know about a little bit about, you know, law, constitutional law and, you know, uh, individual rights and guarantees. Uh, so what, what I can say is that if you are in business, finance, health, I mean, you have something that you can share. And you don't need to build an organization in order to start sharing something or helping others. You can just, you know, start doing it. As I said, I, I started going to a public school nearby my law firm at that time. And after, you know, two weeks, I went to the second public school. And then after two years, I incorporated an organization. And now we, we have more than 120 uh, volunteer lawyers working. And I mean, the, the answer is kind of, you know, cliche, but it, it makes me really happy to work with public education and students that are willing to, you know, learn and listen to you and change their lives. And when you see, for example, we have a, a student now that her goal is, was to go to Harvard. I changed her mind is to go to Stanford now. So, <laughs> and, and for her, it's like, you know, three years ago, she told me that her goal was to work as a telemarketing operator and that that was it so if you create this kind of you know change of perspective i mean it, uh, there's no words that i can just describe because it just makes me happy and makes me keep doing it and that that that's it for me Again, I have mentioned already a little bit that I, I got experience this social mobility of getting to go to Stanford after being born in a lower middle class neighborhood in Mexico. But my true inspiration was my mother. My mother is from Michoacán, uh, from a rural community in Michoacán where she didn't have the opportunity to attend to school. She actually never had the opportunity to learn to read and write. Uh, she has eight children. So I was, and since I was a child, I always noticed this contrast of what I was able to get because I was having a good education versus what my mother had 
all because I was born in a city with more opportunities and she was born in a rural community. So I started to notice this. And um, to be honest, at the beginning, when I was a child, I wanted to be rich. I wanted to get out of poverty. I wanted to get a nice house and not drive a nice car. And I started uh, my career in consulting, but luckily I realized soon enough that I needed to do something to change the life of many children in Mexico, the way that education changed my life. So like, how could I do that? So uh, since I was in college, I started to work in particular, I was in Texas A&M working with immigrant students that did not know any better. They were coming from these rural communities from Mexico to the United States and didn't know what was available for them. So I, I remember the happy that they will make me when I will be teaching them and seeing when they will see more opportunities open to them. And I started my career at Deloitte. That didn't change, but it, it, it took me two years in Deloitte to realize that I wasn't happy by just making money myself and that I needed to go back in the education sector full time. So I created this plan in which I was gonna come back to Mexico and I was gonna come back to do something great for education, that I couldn't just come back to work in the private sector, that I needed to work in an education organization that was gonna do something. So it took me six years to get to this plan, but uh, luckily I did it uh, within that time and, and I love it and I'm happy that I'm doing it, but I would like to advise anybody here that is thinking about supporting a social problem to do it sooner uh, than later. The world is changing very quickly. We're seeing bigger problems with climate change, bigger, bigger problems with gaps in terms of race, in terms of society, in terms of that. If we don't invest and put the best and the most talented people in to solve this problem. I don't know what's gonna to happen to this world in 10, 15 years. So I urge you not to wait to, if you have this part, give up that consulting job, you're gonna survive, uh, you're gonna love it and it's gonna change your life forever. And you're gonna change the lives of thousands if not millions of people. In my case, I have some similarities to the other stories. So I also have a personal trajectory that was very impacted by education. So I studied in a public system and most of my K-12 education. But for high school, I went to a private school and I saw the difference in the quality of education in the types of opportunities I had in that school versus the, my colleagues that stayed in the public school. Still, I decided for college that I was going to study mechanical, uh, mechanical engineering. Um, and I was thinking of uh, a specific type of career, but then I engaged in a extracurricular activity uh, in which we did consulting projects in our areas of expertise, but it was a very transformative uh, opportunity for me. And our mission as an organization, I, I had the opportunity to lead the organization that organizes this, the, the local uh, junior enterprises uh, throughout Brazil. And our mission was to uh, develop leaders to transform Brazil. And then I was very excited to join the two things, the education need that we have in Brazil with this sense of duty, I think. Um, and I decided to start working in education right out of college. So I did this always, even when I was a pain. So I started in an ed tech, adaptive learning ed tech in Brazil. It's called Diki. It's founded by a Stanford alum also. And one thing I can add here is uh, I knew it was education, but I didn't know exactly what, what in education for profit, not for profit, and technology or not, and everything. So I did start trying with for profit technology. Uh, we did adaptive learning uh, to schools throughout Brazil, private and, and public. And I realized why I was managing projects for like state education departments in Brazil for Geeky that we were solving a very sophisticated issue uh, and problem 
uh, while students were not having class because someone forgot to pay the bill. Students were not in class because uh, teachers were not showing up for class every day, or they were not in class because food did not arrive. So the problems were a lot more basic. And with that, I decided to change my career from technology for education to education management. I think there's a real opportunity in improving management in state education departments, municipal education departments. And then that's when I went to Bain and Company because Bain uh, used to have a lot of uh, interesting projects for states in Brazil in which they help with strategic planning, management and everything. Um, I had the opportunity to work as a Bain consultant to Instituto Sonho Grande. That's how I came uh, here uh, afterwards. And um, I, I, I did learn a lot in education management while I was at Bain. Of course, I did a lot of beer, cosmetics, and all of other things that we do uh, in consulting projects. But anyway, I could direct a little bit of my time in government and education projects. And after being, I went to Stanford for my master's in education. I felt like I needed to, to have this deep dive in the sector before I, I uh, made another move uh, to work deeper in education. And I am since then, um, at Sonho Granger, and I am also, as you can see, I think very excited uh, about what I do. Uh, the career I had was not that straight. A lot of people try to understand what does Bain have to do with this decision and career in education. But I think the important thing for me was like to start somewhere and then learn more and refine uh, what aspect in education I wanted to work with. What the joining that with uh, my skills. And I'm really happy to be working with this uh, through Sonho Grande, where I can join education management, but also a school, a specific school program and have this opportunity given to a lot of students in Brazil. I think in the interest of time now, we're gonna um, open up to some questions and I am gonna start here with the first question, um, which is an interesting question um, for the non-for-profit sector. The question is, what opportunities do you see to enlarge the philanthropic pie in that am? Today, only 0.2% of Latin America GDP goes to philanthropy compared to 2% of the United States. Um, does anybody want to take a shot at that question? I would like to open up um, saying that at least for Mexico, the nonprofit sector has traditionally been uh, non, um, less professional. And I don't know if the right, the, that's the right word, but people that have an MBA from Stanford don't go uh, to a non-for-profit. Um, usually the non-profits -for -pro non are established because of a personal link. So if you have a son, a daughter, a friend, that something happened, then you start this non-for-profit in, in relation to that. So it's usually people that are very, motivated, self-motivated by, by the situation, but not necessarily as professional. So I think in Mexico, sometimes that creates an issue of reporting, of accountability, and it makes um, fundraising harder. I do think, however, the non-for-profit sector in Mexico is moving towards a more professional sector, and that will actually allow us to increase the percentage of, of giving. So, well, that, that's kind of opening up the question, uh, but any thoughts on that? I want to start by saying that in Mexico is even lower. The last number that I saw was in 2017 was 0.1% compared to 2%. And I think uh, I, I agree with Julia. One of them is, is the responsibility and our job of us nonprofit to gain the trust or donors, philanthropists to say that we have the professional skills that we really impacting the, the, the people that we're saying that we're impacting. So is part of our responsibility, but it's also a cultural aspect. So uh, when I moved to Mexico after expanding in 14 years in the United States, I noticed this difference. I will create a campaign for an organization that works in Mexico, that supports Mexican students. And like 70% of the donations that I will get will come from my friends in the United States, uh, Americans and 30% only from Mexicans. And I will be like, what is happening? Like, why can Mexicans not support 
a Mexican nonprofit uh, that is helping students. And I read some studies. And one of the things that I found is that it has to do with family names. So actually in Mexico, as we compare it to the US, the US is a more individualistic society in which people decide what to do with their money. They're empowered to say, what am I gonna do? In the case of Mexico, these wealthy individuals, their name, their last name carries power through generations. So they are more scared to give more money because they gotta keep that, that going on. So like it had to do with that individual and a collective aspect of society. So definitely we need to figure out ways in which we change that. Other aspect was security. Many Mexicans also given that the crime, the corruption, et cetera, they don't feel comfortable giving big amounts to a nonprofit because they don't know where, what are the repercussions of, of that. So it's first trusting the nonprofit, what if they don't use it for the right thing? We have seen many cases in Mexico of corruption, so they don't trust this. And also the, the privacy, like what if they post in a place that two, I donated 2 million pesos to this Mexican nonprofit, and then someone wants to kidnap me or rob me and things like that. So I read those things, but like uh, to summarize, part of our job is to be responsible and, and creating trust with, uh, with the donors and invested, invested in talented people. So actually hiring people for development. You cannot expect to fundraise money if you don't have people that know how to fundraise. In the case of Enseña por Mexico, there is six of us that are always actively looking to get this. And we have a study psychology, we have a study reports to understand how to cultivate uh, relationships with donors. And the second aspect to figure out ways in which we break, uh, we break out these mindsets uh, of why we don't donate as a Mexican population. So that's what I would like to say. Um, we have uh, another question. Um, what is the best way to support rural areas in the region without promoting brain drain? Rural areas rarely offer education beyond middle school. Do we encourage students to leave or do we invest in decentralizing high school and higher education systems? Um, so speaking, speaking from, from our perspective, uh, brain drain is, is a giant risk in our model. Uh, at Lala because if you find these super high potential kids and then supercharge them, give them access to networks and so on, then what's, what, what holds them or what makes them return or stay in their communities? Uh, there's, there's a few ways we, we think about it, uh, Daniel. One is that instead of filtering first for high achieving kids, uh, as most organizations do, we filter first for purpose, for purpose connected to their community. Right? Like we, we're looking for kids who see themselves as uh, potentially being agents of change for the community, the province that they grew up in. And that is that can be a very strong motivator if you, if you feel like your province or your community has been forgotten or deprioritized by the capital city, by Washington DC, by the elites and so on, then you're like, maybe I can do something about this. Uh, and, and, and that is that is one, one first uh, mindset shift in what we filter for. Then part, part of the idea longer term is that by developing this generation of uh, diverse and geographically distributed uh, change makers, that we don't have to continue thinking about how do we go out there to those communities to transform them from here, but rather how do we develop the change makers from within? And if and there's actually a lot of uh, interesting development uh, developments emerging all over Latin America, very decentralized, very organic, very grassroots. The problem is that they're not well organized, uh, but that can be one way that you can avoid the usual issues uh, of like, oh, the teacher didn't show up in the school or, oh, the kid has to walk two hours to go to the school and there's no lunch at the school. 
these are all very foreign problems to us because we're solving problems that that we don't really understand, we don't live there, and so on. So developing leaders in those communities and empowering them to find the best tools out there for their communities, I think can be a much more sustainable uh, solution. And what we're finding at Lala is that uh, helping these kind of kids from rural areas, from favelas and so on, to find their unique value proposition to the world can be, if you're just looking at it from like a behavior economics perspective, that can be a more dominant strategy for them than trying to get into a good university, study a good degree, and then compete with everyone else in the world to get the consulting job, the investment banking job, the engineering job. Uh, for all the Brazilians, right? Like that one Edu Lira of Gerardo Falcones, that's a much better personal strategy for himself than trying to get a standard job. And we're realizing that we can do this systematically. But as you've heard all of us say, these things are systemic, right? Like it's not enough to just find a kid from a rural area, give them access to education, because then who's going to fund them? Who's going to be their mentor? Who's going to give them that first internship? So you have to tackle both the education and the network, the ecosystem, the community at once. And I think a few of our models are doing that. I know at least Lala is, I know that Teach for All is, uh, I, I, I don't want to speak for the others, but uh, you have to think systemically because otherwise, if you over-focus on, on the one little thing you're moving the needle on, then there could be a cliff at the end of your program and the kids fall off after that. Okay, um, another question here says, how do we best help nonprofits? Well, money first, and <laughs> but also your time. I mean, we, here we focus on people giving their own time, and that's the most important asset. And money is just a consequence, but, but that's it. I mean, for us, it's, it's really simple. Because, I, I mean, you go, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, sorry. I, I will say that, and definitely here I'm going to be more direct, definitely money. Uh, I think is the main need that we have nonprofits. The four of us, I mean, that we have a nonprofit, we're always looking for fundraising. So if you want to support a nonprofit that you trust the team, that they're showing you the, the results, the best for you is to give money or like I will say to Felipe, to give your time in areas strategic to the organization. Many times we have companies reaching out to us to volunteer to paint a school. Like that is not your talent. If you really wanna help us and you are a financial advisor, come help us with financial advising and give us the money to operate. But like definitely, I, I, I definitely say that it is the need for resources in nonprofit. We already see these numbers 0.2% versus 2% in Latin America. We definitely need more money from individuals like us that that can afford it. And other thing is giving it unrestricted. Again, it's like do not limit the way you're giving your money because you are limiting the nonprofit for its opportunities to grow. Of course, as a nonprofit to give you the results of that core program, do not create a, a particular program for your company. Allow them to use that donation in the best way possible for them because the people that know better how to use that money are the people that are in the communities. And I can assure you that in the case of Enseña por Mexico, we are so transparent with these resources, but it is better for us when you allow us to invest these resources on the area that we need it the most. I'd like to add a, a, a perspective or from a nonprofit that does not fundraise. Um, I, I can imagine the situation is similar for you, Julia, uh, in the case of the foundation. So we, uh, of course, understand that nonprofits uh, generally uh, have this as a primary issue. Uh, one thing that I would like to reinforce is the, the point that Juan made about uh, giving your time in a specific thing and what is your expertise. So as I said, sometimes uh, having a great team 
doing their best is uh, an important challenge for us. So, for example, having the consultants helping us in the strategic problems uh, or having, I don't know, Stanford trained uh, marketing specialists or people specialists mentoring our leadership team, for example, helping getting them motivated because having experienced mentors references uh, also helps with motivation, but especially guiding us uh, in navigating uh, whatever are the issues are specific for the organization. So even, uh, even when resource uh, money is not necessarily a need, there is still a lot of things uh, to be done and we are open. Uh, we're going to send our contacts afterwards through the email. So we are uh, very excited to have uh, support coming from all of you, the Stanford community. Um, I would, from my perspective, well, plus one to, for, for any nonprofits out there fundraising, I would add plus one uh, to everything Juan Manuel said. Uh, what I would add also is uh, to, to, I guess, have an understanding of, of how, like how much you will really commit to supporting a nonprofit because what, at least what has happened to us is that sometimes people are like, oh, like, how can I help? Uh, or, or, hey, let, let's talk and let's talk about it next week and we'll, we'll find something. And then you have a lot of exploratory conversations with people and then many of them eventually are like, oh, no, like, I, I was just shopping around. Like, this is actually not the right fit. Or they're like, okay, cool. Like, this is the right fit. I can give something like, like three hours per week. And all of a sudden, with all the overstretching you have as a, as a nonprofit founder, on top of that, now you have to manage a few uh, external volunteers who are putting in relatively few hours. And I mean, so, potentially those, those can be very high impact hours, but just remember that in part you're entering especially if you're bringing a particular set of expertise, like you're a consultant or investment banker or something, uh, to also bring your humility to come with an open mind to learn what are the challenges that this organization is facing, to be very self-directed as much as possible, like come in and, uh, with, a, with a genuine mindset of how do I uh, provide capacity, reduce workloads, uh, or like don't, don't see it primarily as like, oh, it's going to be fun to talk to different people in this org and have interesting conversations with the founder and so on because they're overstretched. They're super busy. So being like, like if, if you have access to, to the founder, the C-levels, just be like, look, tell me what are the biggest, what are the biggest problems you have right now? And let's figure out which one I can just completely take off your plate. Uh, and if you, if you are coming in knowing that you want to prioritize this, and that you will have both the time and the energy. And I think sometimes people don't think about this, right? They're like, well, I work 80 hours a week in consulting. I have another 15 hours per week. I want to volunteer. The problem is that those 15 hours, you don't have energy. <laughs> so thinking about, okay, how many hours with energy you actually have that you can genuinely commit to and that you can have a conversation with the leadership team and say like, all right, what is something, what is a problem that I can take off your plate? I'll report back in two weeks. If it's fundraising, amazing. It could be some operational excellence improvement project. It could be building partnerships, uh, but figure out how do you take work off the org uh, and also bring in this, this learning mindset to all of this. Uh, it can be super, super helpful for ours. Like I think we're out of time. So I would just like to close by saying um, if everybody could give just a one liner of what you want anybody to take away, if you could just say like one thing that people could take away from this, what would that be? Well, um, I think we, we discussing before I shared this vision that there is amazing talent and productivity being wasted in Latin America every day because we have such a poor education offer. So in any ways that you can, everything that we just talked about, uh, engage. Uh, a lot of your businesses and our countries will 
uh, benefit a lot from this. Along those lines, I think I would like to say um, that education is a very complex problem and is, it requires a systemic change. And by that means that all of us, no matter what field, uh, who we are, we need to be involved to change this and make the world a better place. It is our responsibility to make a world a better place. And uh, so I will leave with that. Well, for me, I think that because it's such a huge problem, I mean, if, if you can just donate like a small part of your time, I mean, you don't have to quit your job or something like that. You know, I have my two lives that I always say in the morning, I work in the NGO and like after 9 a.m. I go to my job. And so if you at least start doing something in your neighborhood or, you know, some, someone that you know that needs needs an educational opportunity that would be more than enough to start and then you get addicted and then eventually you quit your job but you know before that at least do something and uh, you'll be helping a lot of people uh, for me i i'd like to leave you with two senses of urgency that that have been very alive in my journey uh, the first is that, like we talked about, these are pressing problems in Latin America. Um, our educational systems, our social mobility structures are all broken. And who knows how many Nelson Mandela's and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates are being wasted every single year in Latin America. So kind of like that quote of like the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. <laughs> I think it's exactly the same for these issues in Latin America. We should have solved these problems decades ago. We didn't. The next best time is right now. Otherwise, uh, we have totally deserve what's coming our way <laughs> over the next few decades. So that's the first sense of urgency. The second one, uh, I hope you heard us talk about everything we've learned. Well, I, I, I think we've only scratched the surface of, of what we've learned since we joined this journey. And that's often... Uh, something we don't talk much about, right? Like we, we always say how satisfying, how gratifying it is, but you also just learn so much about the most complex problems in the continent. So I think there's also urgency for yourselves to get involved somehow. At, like not everyone's going to be a founder or a funder. You could be a volunteer, an advisor, a supporter, but just start getting involved so that you can start learning about these issues. Uh, Otherwise, uh, I mean, at least I remember the story we told ourselves at McKinsey that like, oh, we're learning all of these transferable skills and one day we will, you know, just transfer them to the most complex problems that we've never talked about. And I, I think that's a little bit naive if you're really trying to get into these completely intractable social economic problems in Latin America, there's urgency in your own learning. So get involved as soon as possible. Thank you everybody for sharing that with us. Um, I think we, um, as we wrap this up, we can all agree on the fact that um, education in Latin America is something that we really need to focus on. The region will not move forward until we actually tackle that problem. Like Juan Manuel said, it is a complex issue with many things um, involved, but I am sure that each one of you guys from your own set of um, your own space are doing um, a lot to advance it, to transform it. Um, I think that you are using, um, like we said it originally, so many things that we have learned throughout our time um, during our career and at Stanford. And I think that is gonna come um, to transform and to really impact the education system in what you do. Um, I echo um, what Diego said at the end, this is urgent. We really need to solve this problem both for the present, but more specifically for the future. And we must all participate in some way. And I think everybody said how we're gonna participate, but I just would like to close um, adding what I think that I would like everybody to uh, take away. And I think um, sometimes with the day-to-day, -day, sometimes with our jobs, our families, we just don't see things. So I used to drive before to a school, um, to my job and go back by a school and the school had no computers and no windows and I didn't notice. 
you just keep your job and your day to day makes you stop seeing. So I think what I would like everybody to take away from this is we cannot stop seeing. We need to see, we need to focus on the problem and we need to participate in this problem so Latin Americans can all move forward. I don't know if anybody else wants to add something else or if we go back to you, Mary. <laughs> 